Today I'm joined by directors Sally El Hosseini and James Krishna Floyd to discuss their new film Unicorns. A visually daring and heartfelt portrayal of modern masculinity, the film follows a queer South Asian club performer living a double life who meets a straight single father mechanic with whom unexpected sparks begin to fly. The film is screened at Toronto, the London Film Festival, BFI Flair, and many more. It will be released in UK cinemas on July 5th. Good morning, Sally and James. Thank you very much for joining me here. We're in Dalston in London, and I'm very excited to talk about Unicorns, your new feature film. So I've really enjoyed, as I've been seeing people writing about this film, program notes for festivals, reviews and things. They're describing it in many different ways. Um, relationship drama, LGBTQ story, um, Gaijin cinema, I think um, I enjoyed as well. How are you describing it to people? What is Unicorns to you? And yeah. How's that going? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> What's unicorns to me? Um, so obviously I'll speak for myself, but um, I think to me uh, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a romance. I think for me at its core, I think it touches on a lot of hot button issues, but mm. I, that was never really supposed to be at the front of things. What what really was very appealing to me is that it's. I think it's about uh, a sort of simple man who falls in love with a complex woman mm. who turns out to be a man. And I think that's something that can really create a lot of talking points around it. Mm. But the story came to me from reality, from um, my own experiences, but also um, a very close friend of mine, Asifa Lahore, who uh, is the production consultant on it and one of the co-producers and is a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a sort of legend of the Gaijin scene. And also a lot of the, the Gaijin queens that I am now am very close with and got to know over the years. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I hope it's just about love and, and you know, I hope it means different things, different people. Um, but it's, it's, it's many things. It's dramatic. I, I think it's funny. I think it's sort of thrilling in some ways. I think it's entertaining. I think it's also quite cerebral. Mm -hmm. It's slow. It's fast. It's colorful. It's gray. It's all these things. Those are the kind of stories that, that, I really like, and I think we're often into mm. uh, stories that you can't really pin down into one specific thing. Okay. Um, but if I had to if you put a gun to my head, I'd definitely call it a romance. Yeah, it's, it, for me, it's a love story, and it um, explores having multiple belongings and fluid identity. Mm. And it, um, what spoke to me when I read James's script um, was, you know, being half Welsh, half Egyptian, having multiple belongings myself in life, um, never being one thing ever mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of my own identity. Um, you know, th that appealed to me in the characters and, and it really touched me when I read the script. And that's why I felt very lucky to go on this journey with James and co-direct it with him. I, mean, I agree with everything you just said, really, I think. And then in terms of the film, and what initially grabbed me when I watched it for the very first time is this... Um, going going into a world I didn't know anything about. And I think, uh, actually, when I reflect about a lot of my favorite films and, and what cinema can do, I, I think it does often take you by the hand into something you don't necessarily know when it's like a thrilling journey. So that aspect of it, yeah, I found very interesting and exciting. And also that mirrors, like you touched on, uh, Luke's journey in the film. He's going into, you know, a world he doesn't know anything about and um, discovering things by himself along the way, I think um, it's fair to say. Um, yeah, so I'd like to understand, I think, a little bit more from, from each of your perspectives. And James, you, you touched on it a little bit, that, you know, the inspiration and what actually went into developing that screenplay and how much has it changed over time as you've, as you've gone on now to co-direct it together? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, the inception of the idea really came from what Sally was talking about before, is I, I'm also mixed. I'm half Indian, half English. Mm. Um, and I think, um, again, you know, I, I also am quite confused about my identity and, and I've never really understood this idea of having very strict, quite defined identity labels mm. when it comes to sexuality, gender, I think even other things like class, race, mm -hmm. culture to a certain degree. And I think because we now live in a time where we're almost encouraged to be our hashtags mm. and double down on them, especially on social media, that can be very comforting. I think that can be great. I have friends who really live by their labels and and it's almost like they're their kind of homepage. 
it's just for me, my experience has not been that at all. And still to this day, I, I, I don't know who I really am. I, I think I think we're all like that. Mm. And, and you should have that ability to change and to contradict yourself. You know, you, you can be one thing on a Friday mm. and an experience on a weekend can totally change you for who you come out mm. to be on the Monday. And I think I, I wanted to bottle up that feeling and, and put it in a film. And um, the specifics of the story came to me because... I have a lot of family who are who are white and are from East London and, and live in Essex. Mm. That's a world I, I know and is authentic to me. And also, um, my my Indian family are a big inspiration for Ashik and Aisha's family in the film. Um, but I think more than anything, it, it was the world, the Gaijin world, that I think just really struck me. It was a world that I knew about, mm. and, and I'd I'd been to Club Carly when I was younger. I dipped my toes in it, but I, I wasn't at the core of the scene. It wasn't really until I met um, Asifa Lahore, who is a very famous figure in the Gaijin scene. I met her probably around eight, nine years ago. Mm. And we've become very close friends now. And, you know, I'd always known about the Gaijin scene. Um, I'd been out to a couple of their nights. I'd, I'd been to Club Carly, and, but I, I wasn't really at the center of that scene. I hadn't got to the core of what it was about, the beating heart. Mm. And um, it was when I realized I wanted to set the story in that world that I, I just, I asked the see I said, look, would you be okay with me making a film set in your world? And, and luckily she said, yes, she'd actually seen a film that we had done a few years back called My Brother the Devil and I really mm. enjoyed it. So um, that was where it really started. And um, yeah, the story just came to me from, from, from that world. With, I, I met a lot of real Lukes, a lot of real Aishas mm -hmm. and Ashiks. You know, this is a story that is, um, it's not ripped from headlines, it's ripped from reality, mm. you know. Um, and that was where this idea of it being a love story became so clear to me that it was the best way in. Mm. Because if you think about it, you know, a lot of these gays and drag queens, they're, they're really kind of rejected from all sides. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a subculture within a subculture. So they're not accepted by the majority of the South Asian community, of course not. They're not accepted by uh, the majority of the Muslim community because a lot of them are Muslims. Mm. They're not accepted by mainstream society, obviously. And they're also not accepted um, by the mainstream LGBTQI plus community. Mm. So, you know, really there's only certain people that they feel they can relate to mm. and, and, and fall in love with. And one of those are, you know, quote unquote straight white guys. Mm. You know, so I think... Um, it was very interesting and, and I think the story is cross-cultural, obviously, and that's a big part of, of my life and obviously Sally's too, too, you yeah. know. And um, yeah, we just wanted to bottle up that feeling of, of identity confusion and put it in a romance. Did you have a moment then when you were first introduced to this scene, a bit like when Luke goes into that club at the beginning of the film, it's quite an overwhelming experience. Did you have one of those where you were like, wow, this is interesting? Like, I don't know, did that happen? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, that particular scene going... You know, as we down say, the down hole. the rabbit yeah, yeah. hole. Um, <laughs> it is based on a restaurant that had a basement underneath it. Mm. And it was an Indian restaurant that was quite conservative. <laughs> but it made decent money by putting on secret gaijin events okay. underneath. And there was this little spiral staircase mm. that goes down. So that was inspired, yeah, by, by everything in the movie it comes from something. Yeah. Real. Yeah. I would love to find that restaurant. I mean, there must there must be multiple <laughs> restaurants like right now doing that, right? Yeah. Yeah, somewhere. well, right. I think since COVID, the Gaijin scene has been knocked quite badly. Mm. Um, it got hit quite, you know, and, and mm. there's not as much, I think, money flying around. And there was a lot, but it's, mm. it's hard right now. And there's a really big night called Hungama that um, has done very well, but recently has had to, I think, temporarily shut down. It's, you know, it's a very, there's a lot of security issues. Mm. As you see in the movie, you know it's 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 tough to put on those nights. is uh, It's not easy. Yeah. So um, it tends to be more private parties and things like that. Yeah. Where people mm. are meeting. You still have the private parties as mm. you. There's a scene, obviously, what we call the mudra scene mm. inside the mansion uh, with all the millionaires yes. up in Birmingham. You know those parties still happen. Mm. They're very behind behind closed doors, and I, and I went to a few of them. Mm. But in terms of the actual club nights. They're obviously a bit more open. They're sort of open secrets in a way yeah. within the community. They're harder to put on. I, th I think it will change because there's a new generation coming through now that's a lot more bold. You know? Sure. And I mean, it just like, I suppose, uh, again, I'm wondering, but your, your film focuses specifically on certain locations too. So of course, this is London, Birmingham, 
and then maybe I suppose Manchester, even yeah. you know, if we're going yeah. to the north of England. Um, yeah, so there are hot spots where, just like I suppose, there's a lot of people who belong to the subculture. They, you know, they're going to find each other in larger cities, and these things will yeah. exist a bit easier, you know. I suppose so. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, I, like I say, I feel like I learned a lot, a lot about that specific scene through the film, and it was very interesting you know, to see the way you put it together. Um, so then, Sally, at what point do you come in and start work on this project? You know, is the screenplay complete, or is this always being developed throughout between yourselves somehow? So I've been hearing about it from James for what the whole eight years he was working on it, and you know, it was a film, and then briefly it was a TV series, and then. Um, you were turning it back to a film during mm. the pandemic and it um, that was when another film I was working on the swimmers um, fell apart a little bit and we didn't know whether that would continue mm -hmm. and I was free and suddenly I had been hearing about how James was turning it back into a film and I said well we have been talking for a while about co-directing together mm -hmm. and it um, we said well maybe we should do it now during lockdown and mm -hmm. make it as a lockdown film um, and so we started um, to, to do that with Philip Hurd, our producer, and to pull some stuff together. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, Swimmers woke up and I disappeared. And then luckily, James and Philip kept things going. And the plan was always as soon as I finished Swimmers, I would come and we would do unicorns together, uh, which is what we yes. did. I, I mean, I'd like to ask, I guess, because Swimmers, you know, this is at least from my perspective, really successful. You know, it's on Netflix, it's a really great film. If anybody hasn't seen that either, does does that success there help unicorns in any way? Or was the project so, you know, were they developed so differently, I guess? I mean, absolutely. I think that it helped us raise yeah. finance okay. quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody knows how hard it is to make an independent film. And, you know, this, this was the case with this one too. So, you know, you have a lot of no's, a lot of rejection, mm. even after swimmers. <laughs> It's yeah. the same situation. So, um, yeah, it, it definitely helped our hustle to get it pulled together quickly. Mm. Um, and, it, uh, yeah, mm. uh, it, it was a lovely team that came together, though, as a result of Swimmers too, because mm. a lot of our crew yeah. um, were people who had worked on Swimmers that we'd both worked in, because James was in Swimmers yeah. as well. Uh, um, and so they were people we knew from Swimmers that we mm. literally just finished working with who came and joined us on the Unicorns film. And likewise, there were people we've been working with for years who did My Brother the Devil that we were both on that came and worked on it. Okay. So um, it was a bit like the family coming back together in a way. Yeah, it's like a culmination of your career up to this point. You know, yeah. I suppose you, you yeah. learn a lot when you're working with, with people, even each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's going to help, isn't it, um, to get the thing made ultimately. Um, okay, but like if I'm reflecting on the success of the film maybe, and what I guess might be like a, a point of anxiety, it's got to be casting, I would imagine. Because maybe you develop this screenplay, you know, you, you spend yeah. all this time with this story. Again, you feel the weight of, um, you know, the, the community. You, you don't want to let them down, okay? So when it comes to casting, how difficult was it to find Ben and Jason who eventually <laughs> star in the film together? Or did you just find them? I don't know. Yeah. We were definitely wow. anxious about we finding definitely a unicorn. Anxious about find yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I think... <laughs> I, <laughs> I think, I mean, look, um, we've got to credit a few people um, on top of ourselves. Um, <laughs> but Laura Windows, our casting director, is, is really is phenomenal. Okay. And um, we had both actually worked with her and known her um, over the years. And um, Ben Hardy was someone I knew about his work quite well mm -hmm. um, because we just have this weird connection mm. we both have as an act as an actor we both have the same uk and us agent so we'd always been very aware of each other mm -hmm. and um i just i had been quite early on in my head yeah and um and yeah and sally and i watched some of his work together mm -hmm. and we were just like yeah this is the guy <laughs> yeah, okay. it was so clear to us um for, for a few reasons i mean i, I would say mainly Ben is, he has this very, very unusual, I've spoken about this before, but he has this very unusual quality that is, is quite hard to find, I think, in actors of my generation and younger, which is that he can play a character that is seemingly simple mm. on the surface and straightforward, but underneath has just rivers running deep mm. and has a lot going on. And he does a lot with very few words. Mm -hmm. you know, Luke doesn't speak a lot. It's very physical. Mm. It's in his body. That is a hard thing to do. And the way Ben did that, I thought was really extraordinary. His commitment to the role yeah. 
He put on weight for us. He put on the weight, and he just mm. he really embodied yeah. that guy. And and I and you know I know Luke's. I know them really really well. Yeah. And the way that Ben brought something that was very authentic to that role um, is hard. You know, it's, it's not mm. it's not easy. You know, he he he's a guy from the West Country. You know, mm. he's not that guy at all. So once we had Ben, that helped. But then the really the hard <laughs> journey started of trying to find a unicorn. As we, Ellie uh, said, yeah. yeah, we knew we didn't have a film yeah. until we found Aisha Ashik. Yeah, you know that, that's what we knew. And that was something we didn't admit to financiers or anybody <laughs> uh, early on. But in our heart of hearts, we yeah. knew that everything rested on casting that role. Yes. And and, yeah. <laughs> okay, so how was it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we just went hard on social media, on yeah. okay. um, uh, normal casting routes. We saw a lot of people. Yeah. Um, we used a lot of like secret WhatsApp groups in the scene through Asifa and other contacts uh, okay. yeah. that were able to spread the word. And in some ways, it was it was really heartbreaking because some of those videos that came in yeah. were from people who, in their day to day lives, are in the closet, but maybe have this other alter ego okay. in secret. And so there were literally videos coming in that someone had filmed on their phone yeah. in a bathroom. Mm. And you can hear like yeah. their family in the background mm. and they're trying to audition for and you. And doing it quietly. And doing it quietly. Do it reading the lines mm. quietly because they didn't want to get caught, you know, auditioning. Auditioning. For a um, queer South Asian. Yes. Yeah. Thing. Which was heartbreaking, but also put a fire under us and made yeah. us know we really wanted to tell this story mm. um, and, and get it right. So, you know, and and a lot of people sent in personal statements with their audition tapes for just seeing the casting call and how that made them feel seen. Mm. Just that there was, you know, a casting director out on Instagram putting flyers out for that kind of role. And that there was Mm. an authenticity that was being searched for. So, you know, it it was Mm. an emotional journey. And then do you want to tell when we saw Jason? (laughs) (laughs) So Jason, I I, I, I I never I'm not exactly sure what the story is. I, I think it's a combination of Laura found him on Instagram. No, also, but also no, he heard friend, about it. His friend forwarded the the casting right. call that he had seen on Instagram and said, "Jason, okay, you need to audition for this." Right, right, exactly, something like that. But anyway, mm-hmm. Jason sent in his tape, and I think it was just very immediately. It was just clear. Ah, okay. So, so mm. <laughs> yeah. we found someone who can a play this role and can both play sides both of the both role. sides of the role can play mm. Aisha and Ashik, which is obviously a very mm. hard thing to do. Mm. And also, I think that someone who we feel can do the performance aspect because yeah. that was something that was giving me a lot of anxiety. Yeah. I, I was just thinking, how have I written a role that is almost impossible mm. to cast? And um, what really I think did it for me was when he came in and did his chemistry read with Ben Mm -hmm. and his performance was I think the first thing that he did. So as part of that chemistry read, we said we would like you to perform for us Mm. a piece. like Dance. Dance, a dance. Mm -hmm. And did we give the song or? We gave the exact song song that we ended up using using. in the film. Yeah. Okay. That you see. And we said, okay, we would like you to dance to this. And then there were some scenes and some improv with Ben. Yeah. Just for us to see the chemistry. Yeah. Because as, as as we were sort of hinting at, the other piece of the puzzle, which was absolutely essential, is in any love story, if your leads don't have chemistry, you ha- you literally have no movie. It, sure. it cannot work. It's not possible. So that was the other thing. Is that You can't fake it. You can't fake it. So mm. finding an actor who can, A, play the role of our Aisha, but also have the right chemistry with Ben. So yes. this was what was kind of scary. But... This is where we were very fortunate, you know, and the movie gods were smiling on us. (laughs) And Jason and Ben, immediately... It was, it was, it was literally, magic. it's magic. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was, it, yeah. when, when Jason auditioned with the dance, yeah. Ben was like, oh, shall I leave the room so you can have some privacy? He's like, no, come and sit in the front. I'm going to dance for you. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. it was, and it really was. It, it's such a weird cliche, but like it, it was, they have this sort of extraordinary, it, it, it's more than a romance, isn't it? It's sort of like they have this connection. It was instant. Is, I mean, their improv was fantastic. Yeah, it yeah. was just natural and yeah. it flowed. And, yeah. um, James and I just looked at each yeah. other yeah. mid first yeah. take because we mm. were recording. And we it. knew we had our film. And we were like, We've got our film. With excitement in our eyes, and we were like, We've got it. We've got if, we had, if we hadn't yeah. found that, I, I genuinely, I'm interested to see what you say, but I, I, in my head, 
I think I'm not sure the movie would have ever got made because I think mm. it would have been delayed and yeah. delayed. Yeah. And then searching. I think searching and then we would have gone mm. off and probably done other things. But I'm not sure yeah. it would have happened without their chemistry being so natural and real. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you're you're speaking about it, but I, I feel it too, uh, especially in in some of those moments. I, I think I made a note here, like uh, to ask about improvisation because I was genuinely wondering, like we're in the car together and and these yeah. different sections. It's like it really does feel quite often like they are two people that get along really well having a chat, and maybe they are sometimes. I don't know how much you allowed that to happen, <laughs> but it seems like from listening to you, you know, yeah. if they had that connection, so they were able to to do that together, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, well, we definitely um, nicked a few of their kind of real life banter and put it yeah. in, but a lot of it was scripted. Actually, I've got to say, a lot a good, of the was banter good, was in yeah, the script. Yeah, I think it was a good. That was, was the good, basis. It was a good mix of both, and I think it was one of those funny things where, you know, um, they really got the characters. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. myself and Sally spent a lot of time with them mm. for building those characters. We actually prepped you know. them separately, though. Yeah, exactly, and but so that that was quite interesting to talk about, which yeah. is that. Mm. So we, we basically had this idea that... Um, on the, it was on the two poem. On the two poem. After, after we had the, the, scre the, the screen, screen test, test, we were like, their chemistry is so too good. off Let's the chart. Keep them apart. We have to keep them apart. Okay. Because yeah. what's going to happen is they're going to mm. burn out. They're going to get to know each other <laughs> too well. Like and then they're going to annoy each other. So we need yeah. to just separate them so that they can get to yeah. know each other on camera. So the fire burns on in front of camera rather yeah. than... Yeah. Nice idea. And, and, they, and to be fair, they were up for it. And we approached we kept each them apart. of them and we said, yeah. like, yeah. would you be game for this? So everything, the only yeah. time they saw each other in the whole pre-production the period was the read-through. And, and they didn't cross in that. We had them on different sides of the table. They told them not to interact. And even though, they, you know, they wanted, well, Jason wanted to in yeah. particular. <laughs> but I think what, what also happened was that we designed it so the first scene that Jason filmed yeah. was the love scene with Ben. And so that's the first scene that Which was they both filmed brave together. Of Jason. Because we because the reason right, okay. for that was that we so first of all that love scene is obviously that is such an important scene in the film, probably the most pivotal one. Yeah. But but what we wanted was that we wanted we didn't want them to fake vulnerability, danger, um, uncertainty, uncertainty, and discovery because mm. they're discovering yeah. each other in that scene. We wanted to mm. look in their eyes. You know, we wanted the camera to really feel that. And you can't fake that. You, you, you just can't. You can't act that. Yeah. You know. And and that was something they were really up up for. And mm. I think you see it in the, in the scene. Yeah. You know, those close ups in particular. I think you really feel that. Because you know, yeah. you got to remember that they had that one chemistry like yeah. read through with us. Yeah. And they got on great. Yeah. And we all had food together. And then they saw each other once when they read the script. Yep. And then the next time they saw each other, like not for a single costume fitting, makeup no. fitting no rehearsal together mm. they show up on set and the first time they're together is to shoot that scene yeah. that's intense that's an intense scene mm. um that's an intense scene if if they'd rehearsed it a hundred <laughs> times like yeah so yeah. that's brave but, but that does lead me you know that, that sort of bravery in directing to to asking you about um off-screen chemistry i guess you know you're directing together um i want to know what that process is like uh, maybe even technically how does it work for you both? You know, yeah. when you're shooting, let's say a scene like that, what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> James and I, before we went on this journey, we had all these long discussions about how we would split the job. Would we split the job? Would there be areas that one of us would do and then yeah. the other one would do other things? And then as we moved forward with the film and the ball started rolling, yeah. we realized we were just both doing everything mm -hmm. and that that was the best. Yeah. And it, um, yeah. we kind of had like a little private unwritten thing that we'd said which was if we ever really disagree about something um we'll try to shoot it like on set mm. uh, in the moment we'll shoot it both ways and then we can analyze it and have lots of discussion in the edit and ironically but that, we never did it yeah we never did it agreed pretty much all the time mm. no it, it, that's a good point we i think we got very technical before the shoot and we were mm. like okay how are we gonna figure this out just pragmatically yeah from a sort of scientific point of view in a way mm. And then we actually, when we started, we realised that, you know, Sally and I, we're together, we're a couple, we have a child together, we've yeah. worked together a lot, you know. There's we, a reason we've worked together a lot yeah. and work in life exactly. as well. We've got built, communication we, skills. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've <laughs> built up, yeah. I mean, you can even see in this interview, you know, we're mm. kind of finishing each other's sentences, but we're not mm. climbing on top of each other. Like it's, mm. we, we, there's a, we have a real rapport that's been built up over years and years and we're probably not fully aware of mm. how deep that is a lot of the time. So why, mm. why change it? Why force it? And I think what happened, what interestingly happened, I think on set was um, there was all. It became very 
organic and very obvious what I should lead on and what you should lead yeah, on. Yeah, mm. and, and And I think, you know, I'm a really big fan of letting, the, it sounds very pretentious, but letting the movie kind of speak to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really don't think you should force any decisions. I, I think it has to be natural, and you've got to let people play to their strengths. Mm. As soon as you bring your ego into this industry and you start saying, oh, I need to do that, no. What can you bring in that moment, you mm-hmm. know? And that's that's partly why we ended up co-directing, why I wrote it, and why we cast these people, and why, like, why we've got, got certain HODs. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, this is all very, very important stuff. And I think... I'm a big fan of letting things be, and and that's really what happened in this film. It was a very natural process. Organic, like if you had to yeah. give one yeah, word yeah. to describe how it was, yeah, organic. It yeah. was organic. Organic. Yeah. It just it yeah. just felt, you know, natural. And for me personally, having um, directed on my own, you know, directing is mm. very lonely, mm. and it um, it's it's hard because you are the one that's ultimately responsible for the entire vision Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it was actually really pleasurable to share it with James so um, Mm -hmm. even the tense and stressful moments having someone with me to share it with who really understood what we were up against and what we were doing it was almost like we could buoy each other up in those moments Mm -hmm. whereas you're often on your own buoying yourself up in those moments on other other projects and other films so Mm -hmm. in some ways it was a really pleasurable experience and and also practically, mm-hmm. because we were an independent in film. Yeah, yeah. sometimes mm-hmm. we'd be well all the time. We were so pressed for time, mm-hmm. nearly in every location. So you know, after a take, we would literally turn to each other and we go, "Okay, this, that, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You go do that. No, I'll go do this note." Quick. And in yes. half the time, we could have given double the notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. like, <laughs> and we were just tag I felt like team we were like getting that. double done sometimes. Actually, yeah. you're right. I think that. Yeah. yeah but again, got, that that's something that I think is. I don't think everyone can do that, and I don't think I would. I wouldn't want to co-direct with many people, if if mm-hmm. anyone. To be honest, it's just same. You've got to would have you do a. Do it again with me, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, but but this is the thing, is all, well, and, and this is what I'm saying. For, for whatever reason, this project, for the, all the journey that it went through, it was destined mm. to have Sally and myself co-direct it. There are going to be other projects where she directs yeah. on her own, or I direct on my own, or I don't direct, mm. or I just act, whatever. And, and this yeah. is what I'm saying. I think you've got to allow what that project is to, to speak to. And also every project has a very particular set of circumstances. Yeah. The context is so different. You know, if we were shooting this in COVID, maybe things were a bit different. You know, yeah. You've got to take all this stuff into account. And that takes uh, experience, you know, years yeah. of, of making. Collaborating creatively, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, and I and I think that shows as well with the success of the film. Um, I mean, I do want to talk just a, just a tiny bit more about the shoot. Um, in, in this case, the film was supported by Film Cymru. So just to touch on that, Sally, you were born in Swansea, Welsh. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm wondering if there's anything you could speak to on that point. What was it like to have support from, you know, I suppose, you know, the country you were born in to help make this film? You know, what was it like working with Film Cymru? Film Cymru were fantastic. Yeah. They were a great support and I was really happy to be embraced by them yeah. with this film because thus far in my career, I think people often just see my Egyptian side mm. and it's that's the kind of projects that tend to come my way because that seems to be what people are seeing. But I am half Welsh. My mum lives in Swansea. I've got family there. I go there for holidays. So, you know, and, and it's a bit of a strange one because maybe I don't sound Welsh because... Um, when I was a baby, my mum moved to Cairo in Egypt mm. and I lived in Egypt until I was 16. Mm. But then age 16, I went to South Wales and went to Atlantic College just outside Clantwick Major and finished my schooling there and then went off to university, which is why I don't have such a Welsh accent unless I'm with my family. Yeah, yeah. And then it starts to come out. <laughs> it does come out big time. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah. you know, I, I've always maybe again, this comes down to fluid identities I've always felt Mm -hmm. a connection to Wales Mm. and having lived there from age 16 to 18, the countryside, the landscape, people, my Welsh friends, um, they're in my blood and I would love, and I'm actively looking for Welsh stories and I would love to do a film in Wales, fully properly set in Wales with Welsh actors. That's what I'd like to do. In that case, you know, I'm just looking at my notes of things I was wondering about in respect to, you know, Wales, I guess, specifically, you know, you're a female director working in Wales, you know, has your experience been so far that, you know, having support from Film Cymru, like you say, is really helpful in this film, but yeah, in terms of wanting to tell a Welsh story, I'm wondering, you know, is that something you are thinking about, and do you think that there's, 
I suppose, good support there to help you do it, to support diverse filmmakers to make their stories. Yeah. 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 I mean, compared to London, there's mm. less in Wales. Mm. That That's true. But I do see that there is a desire to help more diverse storytellers, female um, storytellers, yeah. filmmakers. And I think that that is there and absolutely something that everyone's conscious of. Mm. I just feel like there needs to, as ever, be more support because mm. the statistics swing the other way and there aren't that many and there could be more and there should be more. So, you know, I, I think yeah. um, it's important for me to just keep making films mm. in the hope that that makes a path for others. Um uh, one of the things I really enjoyed with Film Cymru was they um, allowed, you know, Tina Pesotra, who's an up-and-coming filmmaker, yeah. to shadow oh, cool. um, yeah. th uh, when we were making the film mm -hmm. and getting to know Tina and hearing about her journey and her struggles as a, a filmmaker who's, you know, from Wales mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, comes from that diverse background. Um, you know, it, it's a similar struggle that, yeah. that I've had. So... I don't want to say, oh, yeah, it's all rosy because it's yeah, not, yeah. you know, um, yeah. you know, there needs to be more support. There needs to be more diverse stories. Yeah. And there are incredible stories in Wales. Mm. I mean, mm. that, that are multicultural, that are diverse, that should have female voices behind them mm. and people who are from all different ethnicities telling those stories. Yeah, I remember. It's interesting you mentioned Tina. I remember she made a film, I think, called I Choose. Uh, yeah, we this saw was it. Through, um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it was yeah. through it was through Film Cymru's, I believe, their Beacon scheme. So, you know, again, there is, there is a good, I suppose, publicly funded path to help these stories get out there. It's just that, as as with everything, you know, it could do with more money, more support. It's just and how it's much also, can you do? And yeah. it's also about longevity yeah. because, yeah. you know, sometimes there's support for a first short. Yeah. maybe even mm. a first feature yeah, or it. something and that's it mm. and then it's so hard when you look at the statistics of how many people go on to make a second film after a first film yeah. the numbers are tiny yeah. most people don't and it's that's so sad that mm -hmm. people manage to get a first short or a first film and then not have that continuity there's no there's less support for mid-career um yes. and and that kind of mid-career development mm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, of course, now you're on. Uh, what number feature is this? This was my third. Third, yeah. So you, you know, you, do, you, you know, you're doing well. You're getting up there. Yeah, <laughs> good. I want to keep good. doing it. <laughs> I don't want to stop. <laughs> uh, okay, so very final questions on the shoot. Okay, just quick fire. I'm just wondering, for my own uh, satisfaction here. You know, how long was it? How many days were you shooting for? Twenty six. Yeah. Was that including the extra day? Twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's In pretty the fast. Isn't the numbers it? Ev eventually, it was twenty six. <laughs> I, I believe. Okay, were you, were you shooting London or were you actually going to Birmingham in different cities? All, no, no, all, yeah. all of it was on location aside from the Birmingham stuff. Right, yeah. okay. So yeah. London, so we, Essex and Manchester, Manchester was all pretty much on the, you know, pretty much a real location. Oh, okay, that's cool, yeah. Um, and then I suppose, uh, yeah, I was just asking about the, the improvisation and things again, but like the performance scenes I think were some of my yeah. favourite and I'm wondering about direction because... Do you approach that differently? Are you storyboarding? Are you doing all that stuff? Or do you kind of, I suppose, maybe even let Jason see how that scene's going to be blocked and things? Like, how do you do the performance sections? What's that like? <laughs> Mixture of all the above. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, luckily, yeah. James and I have quite similar tastes. Yeah. So yeah. from a starting point, you know, it's mm. part of why we have a connection yeah. and why we've enjoyed working together. Mm. We love um, emotional emotion and emotional and, and emotional honesty and truth in yeah. performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we both know what that is and what we define that as. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's it's in that sense, we both have the same taste. So our, yeah. our, the end goal that we wanted was the same thing. Yes. But we sometimes found that it was. There, there were certain actors who gravitated to me, certain actors that gravitated yeah. to James. Naturally, yeah. Naturally. Yeah. yeah, of course. And so... And you should let that happen. You shouldn't force it. Yeah. You know? Sometimes people would be calling you up and having long chats with you. Sometimes yeah. someone would call me up and have a yeah. long chat with me about mm. performance. And it was fine. So it was like we saw that there were certain connections developing in that way. So we just said, okay, well, maybe you will give notes to that actor mm -hmm. because currently they seem very receptive to you. Yeah. I will give notes to this actor. And then it wasn't something we did for the whole film, so it's yeah. not prescriptive. It was just in the moment or on that day or in that scene or, you know, th sometimes there were actors that were worried about things that they shared yeah. with James that they hadn't shared personally with mm -hmm. me. So it made sense then the next day for James to be the one who 
went to them gently and gave sure. them some direction. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was... Oh, you, there, there's no... Something we felt. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Sally's absolutely right. It, mm. d- directing, you know, is, is a feel Intuition. art form. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, yes, there's a, there's a very important technical aspect. You need to know the basics. Mm. Well, I believe you certainly do. <laughs> um, but ultimately, um, you know, we're all feeling in the dark a little bit. And I think people... Who, who don't make movies sometimes think that there's these sort of rules that everyone has and mm. you know we talk a lot about having a voice as a director the truth is you know even Wes Anderson goes into every single movie and doesn't really 100% know exactly how things are going to go mm-hmm. he's a very formal kind of filmmaker so I think there is no rule mm. there shouldn't be but a lot of the time I agree with Sally I think I think our instinct tends to be something that has an emotional truth to it. Yeah. And that can be something that's funny. It doesn't have to be yeah. something dramatic or anything. You know, all these things. And really, this is why I believe, you know, w- whether you're an actor, or a DP, director, whatever you're doing in this business, ultimately you're dealing in emotion and you're dealing in your own life because it's your instincts, really. You know, you can watch as many movies as you want and you can mm-hmm. understand every single lens in the world and all these things, and that's useful. But when it really comes down to it, and you've got one minute to get that take before they grab the camera off uh, the DOP's yeah. shoulder. It's your instincts that kick in. Mm-hmm. It's you, what you're seeing and feeling from that frame. And this is where I think Sally is quite right, is that we're very lucky in the sense that for whatever reason, I think we look at the world mm-hmm. and I think movies in quite a similar way. Not always exactly the same, yeah. but a lot of the time, very, very similar. And that's what probably really made this movie what it was you know we had the rule that i would call cut we had the rule because <laughs> well, I, just that, that was it yeah, because that, that just from a practical absolutely. perspective yeah. but i yeah. found myself checking in with james so like yeah. i'd be like okay i'd probably call cut here and i would look at him and he'd well, give that me was, a little that was my eye idea. contact and i'd call it that was my idea because you know i think sally was the one that had made two films mm. and, and i and a reason i wanted sally to say cut is that i knew it would mean something a little bit more Okay. You know, and there's, you know, I think this is the thing as well. Just knowing when to be humble, I think, is a really important thing when you're dealing with an art form. Mm. Knowing what's your skill set and what's not in certain moments, and knowing when to use where people are. But the performance thing was quite interesting because, you know, a lot of the music and all the dance and everything, a lot of that comes from me because, you know, I, I used to spend, I spent my whole teenage years, early twenties, dancing in clubs. You know, yeah. and music's a big part of my life. My mum's a pianist, my dad's a guitarist. I play a bit of piano, and I, I yeah. and all of the songs, pretty much in the film, or the majority of them are from, I guess, a playlist that I built up over the yeah. years. Yeah. So I knew that that was. I knew I, I was going to be able to handle that. But then there were other things that I knew I needed Sally to come in. Mm. You know, and vice versa. Yeah. And again, just just. Getting out of the way of the film is what I learned a lot. It was of, always you know? just what's the best for the film. What's the best for the film? <laughs> you know? and, and it seems like a really obvious thing to say and do, but actually it's mm. not because you know we all have. Well, I think it's with ego. Exactly, where we ego all got, can get dented, exactly. like you know. But where we have this collaborative nature in our life, and we were able to just do it on set. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there wasn't that ego. No. So the shoot was relatively quick. It's never enough time. I know this. Uh, But what was the edit like? How much time did you have to put this film together? Because again, there are some complex elements, whether it's the music, whether it's, I suppose, finding, you know, the the best moments in each scene. You know, how much time did you have to put that section together? Never, Uh, never enough. Never (laughs) enough. Okay, okay. Uh, We were very lucky that we were working with Ian Kitching, editor extraordinaire, who I've only ever worked with. Okay. And yeah. who you've worked with too, so. Um, and Ian's Ian's very close with both of us, so yeah. mm-hmm. I think as a trio, we, yeah. I think it's safe to say this is where our, my ego is going to kick in. The, the, <laughs> the three of us, I think we feel very confident that um, we can make what we need to, what we need out of what we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a is not an easy thing to do, but again, it's this is years of, you know, yeah. a relationship mm-hmm. between the three of us, and I think um. It started on my brother, the devil. Yeah. For, for well, me it started and him, before you that. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Ian and I were both um, apprentices, trainees to a gentleman called John Sickle. We were on a pig farm <laughs> in North Yorkshire, <laughs> okay. where uh, the first time he edited and I directed. Um, 
something uh, and it worked was then. So that was like before entering the industry. Yeah. We both um, yeah. couldn't afford to really go to film school and we found this pig farm in North Yorkshire with this uh, amazing man called John Sickle who sadly passed away. Um, but he decided to set up a place that was like an apprenticeship where you formed a company where you learned 100% practical on-the-job training wow. with no theory, mm-hmm. and he made you employable. That yeah. was his whole thing. But you worked for him by making like corporate videos, by really mm. everybody doing everything. He'd like mm. book a venue in Edinburgh and say, right, you've got to write a play, you've all got to <laughs> act in it, you've all got to do all the stage craft behind it. Um, you've wow. got no budget, you've got to make the costumes. I taught myself how to sew on a sewing machine. I mean, it's that kind of place. What stage of your life are you are you doing this? Where, where, how old are you? Because you're yeah, I, well, I'd finished uh, a degree at university, so I was I was um, 24, 25. Okay. And how do you meet John Sickle? How did you Yeah, that well, yeah. exactly, because <laughs> I was waitressing up in um, Durham, um, and it's yeah. saying I want to be a filmmaker I can't afford to go to film school. Yeah. Uh, um, how am I going to do this? And then I found out <laughs> yeah. about this place. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it was like something people knew. Oh, well, you need to go do this. Yeah, yeah in okay. those days, the internet was still, I show my age now, the internet wasn't so robust. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I even remember, because I was in Durham, going into the Durham Careers Advisory Service and asking for how could I find out about filmmaking courses? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, we don't have anything like that. But if yeah, you want to yeah. be an accountant or a lawyer, I was like, no, I don't. Yeah, I want to um, work on a pig farm. Yeah, so, and, so it's an yeah, incredible place. But that's where I met Ian. So, yeah. you know, he moved down to London. It was okay. the first time he yeah. had tried editing Yeah, was um, at that pig farm. And the first time I had tried directing yeah. was at the pig farm. And I directed uh, something that he edited and we just clicked. Yeah. And so then every time I needed to edit something, we would just yeah. carry on. Okay, so it worked out well. So I've known him for over, I've been working yeah. him for over 20 years, <laughs> since Amazing. 2000. But again, that's the thing, isn't yeah. it? That's the theme. It's it's building up those relationships over the yeah. years, just as yeah. people. And then you met him with my brother, the devil. Yeah. And, and then so we got really close too. So it's like that, mm. you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I always just feel that, I guess we're an example of, I think, life and career mm. meshing. Mm-hmm. And, and I think... That seems like a very scary thing, I think, to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But I, and it was to me actually before you know we were even together because we worked together before we got together. But I, like now, what I've realised is that actually they are sort of one and the same thing. They are, mm-hmm. and and that's fine as as long as. And I think we are quite good at having a boundary and knowing when okay we're with our son and we're doing yeah. this. But ultimately, certainly, I, I believe that you know when you are doing anything that's that's creative, you want to make it very truthful and therefore mm-hmm. it has to be personal. Yeah, and if it's personal, it's coming from your life, whether mm-hmm. it's literal or metaphorical. And I think that's something that we've really embraced. And mm. but it's also people ultimately that you can depend on. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's a trust. Like, it's all about trust. It's like, like yeah. I can cast James into yeah. something and know that I can get him, yeah. and he can yeah. give the performance I need as yeah. an actor. Yeah. I know that I can depend on Ian to yeah. edit. Um, you know, I know I can depend on other people yeah. I've worked with. You know, you, you build up a list of the people that you really know have your back can can do the work and you can really depend on and that you can communicate with well in that case i mean let's let's look at a point where maybe that that all goes out the window ever so slightly which i guess is the <laughs> moment that you that you show the film and you have no control over how people re- receive it necessarily you i've got some uh, names here you know you've screened at toronto london film festival bfi flair manchester film festival you know we're approaching by the time this this comes out you'll be very much getting close to your theatrical release um you know, do you have any particular moments from any of these screenings that stand out to you? And again, I'm also wondering specifically if members of that community that you set out, you know, James, when you were very just starting out with this story, how was it received by people who are members of that community too? Yeah. Yeah, so at Flair, it, it was a kind of gauge and takeover. Uh, our, <laughs> our screening was was full of a lot of people that I know now from the community and others who came. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, they, they love the film and... Mm. And really, you know, I think I, I never really know who films are for. Mm. I never really know if they're for the filmmakers or if they're for the audience or if they're for whatever. But I think in this case with this film, I think if this movie is more for anyone than anyone else, it's for the Gaijin community. Okay. Because I think, like, you think about it, very re- very rarely, if mm. ever, there's been certainly a dramatic film set in that world. Mm. And I think a lot of the time, you know, I feel like we look at drag as something that's unnecessarily comic and nothing else. Mm-hmm. You know, even though yes, that's a part of it. 
Mm. But I think to take it, you know, a bit more seriously, I think is is a bit more authentic. Yeah. Because it's a legitimate art form. And also know? realism and drag, which is a specific Exactly, thing and that's about to come like, Bollywood. Well, this is the other thing, is that, like, you know, in this in this case, in South Asian culture, we've had realism drag for centuries, mm. you know, and that's what you see in the film. Okay. It's, for, it's, it's very different to the American-style drag, which I still love, too, that RuPaul style, yeah, yeah. which is very... Heightened. In your face and fierce. It's a great form of expression and protest. Mm. Realism drag is, is the opposite. It's all about um, being femme in a very natural, subtle way. Mm. It's quite an extraordinary thing, actually. When you when you meet your first realism South Asian drag queen, it's, it's a stunning experience, just like Luke experiences in the movie. Mm. And, um, you know, I think a lot of this movie is kind of for them, and, and it's for that history mm. that's been going on for centuries in, in, in Indian culture. You know, we've, we've had a third gender for a long, long time, you know, and, and I think sexual fluidity and gender fluidity are something that have been in texts like the Kama Sutra, mm. you know, they're obviously very, very old. So, you know, I've always felt like, for me, obviously this is a movie for the world and we hope more and more people watch it, da 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 da, da. Yeah. For me, I think emotionally, I just feel like it's very much for the Gaijin community and I think the fact that they have embraced it, mm. for me, was very, very important. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, you know, I was excited that you, you're showing the film and you're going to be getting these type of reactions and I'm sure there'll be many more stories to come and you know um, I'm, I'm excited to see what people will make of it um, and including in Wrexham where I'm from hopefully we'll get to screen it yes. somewhere yeah, yeah that'd be great so. so I mean um, yeah finally in that case I'd like to just ask a few questions about cinema you know and with Film Hub Wales obviously we're going to help cinemas in Wales book this film and show it to audiences and, and get it out there as well so I'm wondering you know Growing up, was there a particular moment or a memory you have of going to a cinema? Sally, maybe even in Wales, I don't know. You know, which <laughs> cinemas did you go to when you were growing up? And was there a particular film or a moment where you were like, wow, I'd like to do that? <laughs> well, my uh, Welsh grandmother um, worked as an usherette in uh, what was the Swansea Grand, but before that it was a cinema mm. where she was an usherette. Mm. And so my first... Um, introduction i suppose to cinema was an old book of all the black and white old films that she mm. loved and that she used to she had in her house so when i would come over from egypt for our summer holidays and i was we would always stay with her she had this big book that was like cinema from the 20s 30s 40s and all these pictures and she would tell me about the films mm. um and so in that sense it was her stories and that gave me a sense of the, that age of, you know, silent movies, of when colour was first introduced, you know, I would pour over those pictures and they had like mm. a little blurb about all the films um, and the actors mm. and she would always be telling me about these glamorous actresses and things like that. Um, and being in an English-speaking family in Egypt, there were also Egyptian melodramas mm. on TV, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that uh, were kind of the old black and white Egyptian melodramas that I would watch that had musical numbers in them so mm. that was really my introduction to cinema and um, I, I wasn't a child who went to the cinema a lot in fact my first cinema experience was in an open-air cinema in Egypt where I saw E.T. on an outdoor screen wow. with like wooden chairs but it was a big event because I didn't see many films mm. and I used to mm. read a lot so I always had my nose in a book as, as a youngster so um, it came to me quite late the realization that I wanted to make films it wasn't right. something that I'd always dreamed of as a child, but certainly it was my Welsh grammar that first put in my consciousness mm -hmm. films. And of course, whenever I went to Swansea, we would watch all the films, all the blockbusters mm -hmm. of yeah, that yeah. summer because they weren't on in Egypt. So that's, that's something exciting we would do. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And yeah, J James, do you have any memories of this? Yeah, my, totally different to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, so I was originally a theatre cat, you know, I was obsessed mm -hmm. with Shakespeare and the RSC. So my, my dad, um, he was taken to the RSC by his dad and he took me to the RSC. So we saw, mm. you know, the whole histories and I remember watching him. I don't know if you know actors, well, Ian McKellen, but I don't know if you know Anthony Scher and William Houston and all these incredible theatre actors. And that's what blew me away. My introduction to cinema was a little bit later. Uh, it was in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, where mm. I was going through a pretty tough time in life and my mental health was not in a good space at all. And one of the things that helped me through that 
was actually watching late night films on um, what was called Film 4 on 4. Okay. If you remember, there was this thing called um, Film 4 on 4 sponsored by Stella Artois. And it was on <laughs> Channel 4. Okay. And it would have late night movies. But it was movies that like would never usually be on okay, yeah. regular. So you'd have like Caligula or you'd mm-hmm. have like Photographing Fairies or you'd have Kubrick films. That was mm-hmm. where I first saw 2001. Mm-hmm. And what I did was I was so, I was just, I was like, whoa, what, what is this world? <laughs> and what I did was in those days it was VHS. So I would buy in bulk um, those blank VHS tapes, put the white sticker on and I would uh-huh. and I would record all of these films yeah. and I would write in director, I would write in a- mm-hmm. lead cast, I would give a little font for the, the actual... <laughs> I've still got actually these VHSs them, yeah. at home. We, we've got them at home. I I, I'm not letting them go. And, and You've got to let them go. I'm not going to let them go. And I, and I, and I bought this, this crappy little TV <laughs> that I, was a portable TV that I could ferry around. Um, and yeah, I was just in, enthralled by... By films and cinema in that way, it really helped me kind of through a, a tough time in life, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I think cinema for a lot of people can do this. You know, it has it has a real power as as an art form to to take you somewhere else and to you know make you um you know have different experiences. And I think, I, of course, I think that's part of the success of the film that you've made here. You know, Unicorns is that it, it does that. And it again, like I said right at the beginning, you know, I was fascinated from the moment it began. In fact. Okay, even though I'm just going on a slight tangent here, I love, love the opening of this film. That hard cut from like um, Ben, well, Luke, looking off into the distance, like longing for connection, then it cuts to Asia doing the thing. I was like, oh, here we go. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) That's such a good start to a film. Um, Yeah, okay, just a very couple of uh, quick things here to to wrap up, really. Um, Again, just because, you know, we're having this conversation in the context of it going through the, the Made in Wales audience, do you think it matters that Welsh audiences know that a release like Unicorns has a Welsh connection? You know, to, to what point does the sort of, I guess, the, the history of the film and, and where it's connected to and who helps it get made inform it in some way for you? Yeah. Well, I hope that it does because that's mm. what inspires the filmmakers of tomorrow. Mm. So the more that's publicised, the more that's spoken about, it's only a good thing for the next generation of Welsh filmmakers mm. yeah. um, because it's that awareness, you know, to realise that you can, you know, I believe you can tell stories as a filmmaker, about anything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that, you know, a, a one-legged ballerina makes a film about a one-legged ballerina. Mm. You know, I think you, you know, even that thing that is often said to first-time fil- filmmakers, oh, write what you know, you know. Mm. Yes, to a point. I think to a point because um, part of the joy is, you know, inhabiting multitudes. You know, mm. as a director and a writer, you inhabit every mm. character that you create. You, you know, live in them all the way through that film. Even the ones you don't like, <laughs> you live in them in order to bring them to life. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it, that broadness it can be really enriching to have somebody's lens on a story that mm. is, a, is a different take. Mm. You know, I think there's room for us to tell stories that, are, that break out of Wales. You know, Welsh filmmakers should be telling stories mm. about things that are from all over the world yeah. they don't have to just be about Wales yeah that's a really good point actually yeah and I think in some ways this movie is a it's sort of an example of that because obviously it's not set in Wales it's not filmed in Wales but mm. we got a very important piece of support of funding yeah. mm. from film Wales so it's mm. like you know and obviously Sally being half Welsh mm. you know that I think you make a really good point is that cinema is an international medium mm-hmm. and it, and a bit like our film, it kind of has no label, you know, yeah. it shouldn't, uh, you know, it's quite interesting how, you know, before you, you called her a female filmmaker, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But it's like, it's quite interesting how like people, even filmmakers have labels, like female filmmaker. A Welsh or, filmmaker. A Welsh or filmmaker or a, or a black filmmaker or a brown identity, filmmaker. Exactly. Identity, exactly. Yeah, but, like, yeah. but actually it's yeah. like, I've never, I've never understood that. And, and even films themselves, like, mm. Genre really is just a way of sort of Selling marketing it. a movie. Mm. But like ultimately, you know, a story well told is universal. And, it, you know, and I think being very specific is what makes something universal. Mm. So I, I get what, what Sally's saying is that it's important to be local, yeah. but it's also important to be, you know, global. Yeah. And, and I think the two, yeah. they're, they're, they don't need to be, you know, separate. They can be, you know, enmeshed. And I think that's something very important for, I think, sort of Welsh artists and Welsh filmmakers moving yeah. forward is, is knowing how to do both and not just do 
do one. You know, Martin Scorsese just made a movie about the Osage, you know, and he's he's mm. made a movie about Jesus and Buddha, whatever, you know. So it's like, I think that's <laughs> really what filmmaking is. It, it has this amazing ability to um, bring an empathy to the subjects yeah. that are in your film and, and therefore to the communities. Mm. You know, and that, that's a very powerful thing that a mm. camera can do. Is I, I don't think there are many other art forms that, that do it that powerfully with... With, with not just visuals, but sound. sound yeah. mm. The combination of those two mm. things yeah. is really and time. Yes. Yeah. yes. I mean, you know, yeah. you can look at a photograph yeah. that's really like, has an, triggers an emotional response, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's that passage of time mm. you spend watching a film and living with characters or a story, you know, that, yeah. that does something as well. Mm. Well, in this case, uh, I very much enjoyed the time I spent in the, the world you created here. And uh, so thank you very much for sharing it with us. I'm super excited for this film to come out in cinemas um, in Wales and elsewhere. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what people make of it. Um, Sally, James, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah.